Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today's guest is not just a sales agent. He is a coach to all sales agents with his seventh level sales program, the only friction-free persuasive sales system. What is a sales agent? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? I get it. Some may hear the word sales agent and think of some used car salesman pitching you a lemon that breaks down after a week. But in truth, a sales agent is a professional that your company hires to sell products or service and acts as a spokesman for your brand in the process. Acts as a spokesman for your brand in the process. That part is key. In all honesty, I am a bit of a salesman. I am the external face of support for the healthcare system I work for, and I am a business partner to a good friend helping scale his brand as a sales agent. However, each role I play as a sales agent is different. I do not approach a hospital the same way I approach a collaborating brand. In healthcare, I'm not selling anything. I'm building external relationships to create synergy between our health system and community hospitals and providers. I do this by taking a personal approach. I'm not going to get into the specifics of my strategy, but if you are a physician liaison, outreach manager, or strategic manager, primarily in healthcare, reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to have a discussion with you. However, my approach to collaborative outreach for Burnside Knives is much different. There is a unique difference between the relationships I am building with healthcare systems, a service, versus a brand, a product, and that is why sales agents are important. A sales agent is tasked with pitching relevant products or services and ensuring customers have a positive experience throughout the process. When I first started my role as outreach, I spent time cold calling clinics to understand the market. Cold calling means to make an unsolicited call on someone by phone or in person in an attempt to sell goods or service. It is a tactic a sales agent uses to solicit a sale, establish a relationship, or simply acquire information. How does one acquire information through a cold call? Play dumb, of course. Let me give you an example. If I am interested into finding out information on a competitor service or product, I simply call the targeted location and begin to ask questions as if I were a consumer. Because guess what? I am. Playing dumb on the call simply means ask simple questions. I'm interested in XYZ. Could you tell me more about this? Do you provide this service? Does this come with this function? I know I'm going to age myself here, but I legit used to go through the phone book and cold call numbers when I was a real estate agent. I would not advise that. I got a lot of pretty angry answers, but I was learning and it was a great experience to help get over my fear of cold calling. Sales agents can also work through referrals. Listen, folks, I have a backlog of guests waiting to be on the show. I'm not saying this to boast. I am saying this because those are all referrals. When I started this show, I was cold calling entrepreneurs to be guests. I was sliding into DMs, adding folks on Twitter, tagging prospective guests, and resharing their content on the gram. Now I am working through referrals, and it is a large list. But my point is I did this all by acting as a sales agent for the show. I took all of my years experience in healthcare, real estate, Hollywood video, shot out to the wood, and so many other working opportunities. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. Attracting new customers is certainly important, but retaining customers is equally as important. Finding a sales agent to help the business product or service go from cold calling to referrals is what every entrepreneur should strive for. A sales agent is the external face of the brand. In a way, a sales agent is an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur supporting the growth of the global entrepreneur. Thank you and hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Direct 
Selling Association is the 45th highest earning producer out of over 100 million salespeople. He is the host of the podcast Closers Are Losers and the author of the new model of selling selling to an unsellable generation. Please welcome the chairman of 7th Level, Jeremy Miner. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Jeremy Miner, seventh level. How are we doing, boss? I am doing good. You know, it's a it's a nice, cool 106 degree day here in <laughs> Arizona, but that's what happens, you know? There you go. Man, it's calling in from Arizona, trying not to melt. Jeremy... Uh, before we get into the seventh uh, seventh level, I want to actually want to give them a little listeners a background. Who is Jeremy? Give them a little background, uh, career, education, kind of just a little quick synopsis. Who is Jeremy? I don't want to bore anybody. So, <laughs> so yeah, I'm the chairman and founder of a of a sales training company called Seventh Level. We're corporate headquarters here in Scottsdale, Arizona, for the U.S. Our international headquarters are in Sydney, Australia. We have an office in Dubai now. We're kind of all over the place. Nice. Um, but I went to college in, at Utah, Utah Valley University. So my background is behavioral science and human psychology. Oh, interesting. I started learning from very early age, my first sales job in college, that what the company was training me that I got a job for and what I was learning from what I now call the old sales gurus, that a lot of it uh, actually triggered sales resistance. It actually worked against human behavior. So I was taking what I learned from behavioral science, that theory, and how do I wrap that into a sales process? And once I learned how to do that, selling became extremely easy and uh, very, very profitable for sure. So that's kind of a, a basic background of where I came from. Now, I had a 17-year sales career. I retired for about two years in my late 30s. And then about four years ago, I started uh, seventh level. And we've, we've grown grown pretty rapidly, some would say. Yeah, let's let's talk about it. What is Seventh Level? Give the listeners at home a little synopsis. Yes, seventh Level, we're a global sales training company. We train all the way from Fortune 500 clients, all the way down to SMB, all the way down to individual salespeople that really sell anything. And we train them what is called neuro emotional persuasion questioning. How to how to work with human behavior. How to use certain questions and techniques that trigger your prospects to want to engage to want to open up to you and eventually pull you in rather than you trying to fight them and chase them down. It makes selling a lot more easier and, like I said, a lot more profitable for sure. Now, in regards, so when I think of sellings, right, I think I think a lot of people probably think of that like used cars men, right, trying to sell you on anything. What are some of the things you do to kind of flip the script and make individuals, you know, as a salesman, make them like humanize them, kind of make them feel like. Yeah, because if you're using techniques like that, I mean, you're pretty much a below average salesperson in our day because those techniques don't work. Right. Right. People are more cautious, they're more skeptical about making the wrong buying decisions than they've ever been before. Right. So I think, I think probably the the best way to kind of explain what you just asked me is, is doing it this way. So I'll do this. So if you're, if anybody's driving, don't run off the road, but if you've got to get in a piece of paper, write this down. So according to behavioral science, okay, there are three forms of persuasion. Okay. And once you understand where you are now in your current sales ability, okay, even if you're doing good compared to where you could be, it'll completely change everything for you. Okay. So the first mode of communication, I won't give the scientific term. I'll kind of give like names that probably anybody would could recognize, okay? So if I asked you, so Gabriel, if I said, what's the first image that comes to your mind when I say, boy, the room's selling, what would be that image? Oh, I think of like people, stock paper going crazy. Yeah, like Wolf on Wall Street, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the Wolf on Wall Street, you got Leonardo yep. DiCaprio. I mean, it's, you know, that's, sell me that's, this pen. <laughs> yeah, sell me this pen. That's the first thing that comes to your mind, okay? So error one would be like that. Okay, that's the non-scientific term, like boy, the room selling, all right? So we're the least persuasive when we tell people things, okay? Or we tend to dominate them. 
or posture them, manipulate them, push them into doing something we want them to do. Okay. Like if you watch that movie, Boiler Room Sound, like, hey, I've got a great opportunity for you. And then we talk about the features and the benefits, and we have the best this, and we have the best that. And then we try to push them to buy. Right. right. So it's just like if you tell your teenagers that you really, really need to clean your room, and then you keep pushing, 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 what do they typically do back? Don't clean the room. They push back. <laughs> yeah. They push right. Back. It's just, it's human behavior 101. And most salespeople do that. And then they wonder why people push back. It's just it's the way a human brain works. So I'll give you a few examples of the least persuasive way to sell. Okay. So the first way, least persuasive way, according to the science, is presenting. Everybody's like, what? I have to have a great presentation. I have to have my hour and a half of slide decks and I have to show my corporate office. And here's a picture of our founders and here's our board of directors and here's our customer service awards with the JD Power and Associates. And we're a triple A business <laughs> rating with the BBB, blah, 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 blah. Here's all of our clients. We have the best this, we have the best that, which by the way, how many salespeople do you guys talk to that ever say, yeah, Sally, we've got the fifth best service in the market. <laughs> Nobody does, right? Everybody says they're the best. So when we oh, say man. things like that, that we have the best this, we have the best quality, the best service, and we talk down about our competitors, psychologically, just so everybody knows, your prospects actually trust you far less. Mm -hmm. I know people are like, what? I thought they'd trust me more. Well, no. Why do they trust you less? Because every single salesperson that's ever tried to sell them anything has all said the same thing. So they just categorize you with everybody else. Okay, you got to stay away from that. Okay. So they trust you less. So, so typically, according to the data, uh, your presentation, because uh, you still have to have a presentation, right? Presentation shouldn't be more than 10% of your entire sales process, whether you sell B2B or B2C. That's the problem because the average salesperson in B2B or B2C presents over half of the time. That's a major issue, which we could go on for another couple hours for that. Telling your story, okay? Hate to tell you this. When you sell one-to-one, -one, nobody cares about your story. Whose story do they mainly care about? Their own. Their own story, okay? Given a sales pitch. We've all been taught you got to give a great pitch. You ever watch uh, Shark Tank on CNBC? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you see like Damon John, Mark Cuban, Barbara, Mr. Wonderful, all those guys. Watch the entrepreneurs when they come out and they're all excited and they start pitching. Start watching the body language of the sharks. They're like this. They're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Okay, you got to ditch the pitch, all right? Nobody wants to be pitched to and sold at, all right? They want to be asked, heard, and more importantly, understood, okay? Putting sales pressure on them, okay? There is a massive difference and learning the right question skills that trigger the prospect to feel so much internal tension about how bad their problems are and how they have to change that compared to applying external sales pressure on them. Completely two different things. Once we understand the difference in that, you can make a lot more money in sales, all right? And the big one is assuming the sale. According to the data, very low on the persuasion pole, especially if you're in more of a complex sales environment that requires multiple calls and touches. That's the first mode, least persuasive, okay? Second mode is more known as, uh, maybe everybody would identify this, consultative selling. You've heard of consultative selling, oh, yeah. right? Okay. So we're more persuasive when we attempt to have like a discussion with another person, with a prospect, all right? Uh, I would, most of consultative selling came out in the 80s, several books, but one of the most popular books was by a college professor by Neil Rackham, never sold anything, by the way, called Spin Selling. And he taught that you needed to ask logical-based questions to find out the needs of the client, which makes sense, right? Better than boiler room selling, okay? But what is the potential downfall when you only ask logical-based questions? We call those surface-level questions. Well, your prospect's going to give you what type of answers in return? Surface level answers, okay? Logical-based answers. And do human beings make buying decisions on logic or emotion? Oh, emotion all the time. 100% emotion. <laughs> Brain studies without a shadow of doubt. So when you say things like, what's keeping you awake at night? Can you tell me two challenges you're having? Who besides you would be involved in this decision? What are you looking for in a solution? These are all surface level questions. Right. Okay. We have to go much deeper with our questioning and clarifying and probing for the prospect to even want to answer those questions because they know what you're doing. So those type of questions you want to avoid because why? Every single salesperson that sells anything 
ask the same surface level questions. All right, you with me? So more, pers- like I said, more persuasive than manipulating, pressuring, assuming the sale, but you're starting to play the numbers game because you're bringing really very little emotion out by asking surface level questions. All right, now third mode, I'm going to go fast here. Okay, right. third mode is more known as what's called dialogue. Okay, that's era three type of sales. We are more, the most persuasive when we allow others to persuade themselves, when we ask, this is where it comes in, what are called neuroemotional persuasion questions. That stands for NEPQ. Now, people always ask me anytime I do a keynote or anything, like, how do we get somebody to persuade themselves? That's like the $10 billion question, right? Can you just show up? Hey, Gabriel, just persuade yourself. And uh, here's where you send the funds. No. You have to learn, okay, specific skilled questions and when and how to ask those questions, like your verbal pausing, your tone in different parts of the conversation, and a step-by-step structure that will get your prospects to pull you in and sell themselves rather than you trying to push them and chase after them. You see the difference in that? So that's what NEPQ stands for. You know, it's interesting. Such a boring, nerdy stuff. No, no, it's interesting because you keep saying sales, 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 sales. But at the end of the day, you're not selling anything. You're building a relationship. Well, I'm not, you know, building relationships, one thing. I think that means different things to different people. What I'm doing is I'm building my status in that prospect's mind. Mm, when they okay. start to view you as a salesperson. They don't view you as a salesperson. Right, right. They start to view you as the expert. They start to view you as the trusted authority who's going to get them the results they want. They don't view you as somebody trying to sell them something. Yeah. They view you as like almost you have the keys to the kingdom that they will gladly pay more money to to get them where they want to be. Whereas they view all these other pushy sales people as just trying to push something down their throat. And that's how they get treated. So yeah. it's a whole different status that you're elevated to. So why did you start the, so, you know, you 17 years of sales and then you behavioral health, uh, you know, degree. Well, no health, just behavioral or, science. Behavioral science. Yes. Behavioral science. Why, why did you, uh, why did you start this business after being, you know, three years of retirement and joining the good life? I was only retired about a year and a half. Actually. Okay. Plus two years. Okay. Um, well, first of all, probably about a year in, I got really bored. Okay. <laughs> I, read, I, read, I do read a lot. I mean, I was doing something. When I say retire, I was probably still working an hour a day. I was doing some like private consulting here and there, but okay. I was just doing whatever I wanted, right. basically traveling, whatever. Okay. But I started seeing all these ads on social media, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, from all these sales gurus. Everybody was buying their stuff and following it. And I started looking into it and I'm like, huh. If I sold that way, that that guy's telling all these people to sell, I would have made about 95% less commissions. That stuff doesn't work. Like, I know that triggers sales resistance. Like, what they're training people literally is not going to get them what they want, what they're saying they want. So you get to a point where you see that so often, where you have a certain skill level that you've acquired. Nobody's born with those skills, right? Like you're not born out of your mother's womb with advanced questioning skills. Right. Nobody's right. born with advanced tonality skills, right? Nobody's born with advanced objection prevention skills. You acquire those skills. You learn those skills. So you, if you have those skills, which I feel like, you know, God puts people in your direction that you need to learn from to get you to a certain level to, I think, give back and help other people. So I really believe that. So you get to a point where you're like, okay, well, there's millions of these salespeople that are all struggling. They're beating their head against the wall, hoping and praying that something they're going to learn from these guys who haven't sold for probably 30 years is going to magically work for them. And I know it's not because I was one of the top salespeople on the entire planet at that point with what I was making per year. Um, So it's like, what do you do? Do you just like, oh, okay, well, sucks for them. Or do you throw your hat in the ring and you actually help people? And I decided to do that. So that's what we did. Now, not only did you do it, but you have scaled quickly. I mean, you're, you're ranked, you know, in the top 15 fastest growing company in the United States by Inc. Incorporated, top 5,000 companies in 2021. I mean, featured in the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Entrepreneur yeah. Magazine. How did you scale so quickly? Is it is it just because the only, you got the only it? way you can the only way you can scale is because you get your clients massive results. I mean, yeah. we have 
almost 8,000 testimonials in the first four years. Most of those have come in the last 30, probably about 30 months. So wow. you have thousands of testimonials when you have more than probably any other sales training company that's in the United States, that's probably been around for 30 or 50 years. Um, you know, you only grow based on the results you clients get. So yeah, so the last two years, so we just won the same award with the Inc. Magazine. So I'm a contributor for Inc. Magazine now too. I write about one or two articles a month. I'm lazy. I should write one every week, but I haven't got to that. <laughs> but you know, so Inc. ranked us the last two years in a row. So two years ago, we were ranked number 1,232 fastest growing companies overall. But as far as the sales training company, we were ranked number one wow. fastest growing sales training company this year. We moved up to number 391 fastest growing companies in the United States and ranked number one again, fastest growing sales training company. So uh, that's good, but it means, you know, sometimes we have to slow, you know, like push off the gas because as your company grows that fast, you, it's not just about making sales, but it's about being able to fulfill on what people are purchasing. So we could quite literally probably grow faster even now and spend more money on ads and like even double sales in a few months. Uh, but you have to put in the right fulfillment team. You have to train trainers. You have to make sure that you have the structure there. So as you grow, um, you know, you don't have problems where then not all your clients are getting results. So to us, it's more important. Like we will slow down to make sure our clients are getting the results that they paid for to get them where they want rather than like growing crazy even faster. I mean, probably right now, from what we've understood, we're probably in the top seven biggest sales training companies in the United States in the first four years. And we're everybody ahead of us has been around for at least 30 years. Wow. So, you know, it's just about results. But like yeah. I said, I don't run the business anymore. I stepped down as the CEO two years ago. So my business partner is the CEO because he's much better at running the business. And I just focus on all the, the virtual training we do and and all that stuff, training our sales trainers for our clients and stuff. That's that's kind of my wheelhouse. That's what I specialize in, I guess. Speaking of specializing, what what motivates you? I mean, you this is a lot of work. You're putting a lot of work and energy into this. What motivates you to get up every day and just keep going? I, you know, there's a lot of things that motivates me. Um, but I would say the biggest thing that motivates me are, once again, clients' results. Because I love, like, we typically get probably about 10 to 15 new testimonials every single day. So we have, um, we have a lady in the company. That's all she does. She just gathers the testimonials. We don't ask. These are people that just post them in our Facebook groups. Uh, they post them because once you become a client, you're in different Facebook groups that we have, depending okay. on what program you're in. And they just go in and post them. We don't ask. Okay. If we ask, we probably get a lot more, but she gathers the testimonials. I read them the first day when I come in the morning and it just kind of gives me, um, it just gives me more just, you know, the best gasoline in the world. And I just, <laughs> I, going, like I, guess. I don't know how to describe that to I you. Like it just kind of keeps us going because, you know, our, our goal as a company is, is to become the, the largest sales training company in the world. I mean, we, we are dead serious about that, but we can only do that based on our clients' results. So that's why we focus on clients' results first. And because of that, we've grown exceptionally fast for sure. And we'll keep doing that. Now, what keeps you up at night? In regards to a you know business thing, <laughs> you know nothing really keeps me up at night. I sleep pretty good actually. Nice. We have a we have a, a good thing that only gets uh, it seems like it gets better every week. So we're we're excited. We bring a new team team members every week, uh, either in this office or our Sydney Australia office. We have a lot of our people that work from home virtually now. Uh, but we're opening up an office in London uh, around December as well. So we're going to open a big office in London because we have a lot of um, sales trainers and our salespeople there as well. So we're just having lots of fun. I mean, I actually see pretty good, actually. I love it. So what has been easy about this process, about kind of scaling this business the last four years? What's been easy? Well, I'll tell you, the first two years were not very easy, okay. especially the first year, because the first year was me and it was my assistant and one part-time salesperson. Quite literally, I'm not kidding. Like our growth, even in the last two and a half years has been crazy. And how many employees first, are you at now? We have like 107. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah. So like the first year was me and my assistant who decided to come over with me, who was my assistant at my job. So a couple of years, I'm like, hey, I'm starting a sales training company. You want to be my assistant? Sure. So it was me and her basically Love it. for the first year. Okay. Uh, I was trying to run the whole business, do everything plus all the training. And you just, you know. After working, you know, 
seven days a week for a straight year, you just kind of like, well, this is not that exciting, right? So, I mean, I should just go back. If I want to do something, I'll go back into one of my sales jobs or something. But then, you know, the next year we started growing. Okay. And about, you know, a year and a half in, I met my business partner, Matt Ryder, who's the CEO. He actually became a client the year before and we helped him scale his company, which he sold. And then I convinced him like, Hey, come over and be the CEO here. Cause he was so good at running just business in general. And since then, since he came in and built the structure and just had me focus in my lane of sales training, that's when we started going like this, like month, I think month on month growth of about 35 to 55% every single month, month after month, after month, after month, after month. Oh, wow. So then you, it's all about having the right team. Like I can't emphasize, you know, if you're listening to us right now and you're an entrepreneur or you're wanting to start your own business. I know you have to bootstrap it in the beginning, but you really have to get a business partner that has skills that you don't have. So maybe you're really good at operations, okay? And that's your wheelhouse, okay? Your financials. You don't want to have a business partner that's really good at that either. You want to have a business partner that's really good in marketing or sales or something because you have to really build off that foundation. Like your weakest link, your business partner needs to be strong in. And that's why yep. me and... RC are so good together. Okay. Now, you know, we brought on a chief revenue officer now uh, that's part of the company that has really expanded us greatly, probably in the last two years. His name's uh, Marco. And so you start to build the right team. And once you start building that foundation, the right team, marketing team, sales, operation, finances, it's almost impossible to go, especially when you have like products and services that really get people results you just it just it just happens like yeah. you can't stop it at that point but if you don't have the right team you can have the greatest product and service in the world but without the right team you're really not going anywhere i can promise you that you know it's interesting as you mentioned you met uh, you met your uh, partner kind of as a former client and that kind yeah. of how it kind of created how important is networking in the, your business i think networking is really important we have a rule in our company uh that pretty much nobody that works with us um, like any salesperson or sales manager or anybody that's in the any of that side, like they only get hired if they've been a client and oh, understand okay. what we do. Yeah, makes sense. Okay? We don't hire anybody outside of that. We have people apply all the time. Sorry, you're not one of our clients. You want to work for us? Become a client, learn how to sell with what you're selling, do really well, and then we'll consider you to come work for us. And that's just the way we roll. And because of that, We've expanded very fast. But yeah, networking is obviously really important, you know, finding the right team. Um, but, you know, for us, it's very important that we're we're hiring people that already understand what we do and believe in what we do, yeah. right? And most of our salespeople, there's, you know, a few here and there that are a little bit older, but our average age of our average salesperson is about 23 years old. Okay. We hire them very, very young because we want to train them the right way from day number one, okay? And sometimes... We'll have like an old school guy that's, you know, 55 years old and they're just set in their ways and they don't, they just don't want to learn. Like selling's changed drastically since they started, right? Now, that's not to say we don't have older people that are clients that start crushing and then come. We do. But our average person is is a lot younger and we train them the right way from, from day number one. So. Yeah. You know, in, in fact, you mentioned change. How did the sales world change after the, during the pandemic or and after, I guess? Well, I mean, I think, I mean, as far as changing from the pandemic, I think it's more logistical. Um, you know, I think like, you know, we train a lot of companies in insurance, car sales. Well, I mean, we train 158 industries, but I'll give you two different examples. So, you know, there's a, a very large uh, insurance company that we train that has uh, like 13,000 agents or something here in the U.S. And they were freaking out when COVID hit because they're like, Whew. Oh, guys, we don't know what to do. We can't go into people's homes. Like we're, we're thinking about filing bankruptcy. I'm like, what are you talking about? This is the greatest thing that's ever happened to your industry. Because why? Because now your salespeople drive out 30 miles to this appointment. That person's not there. So then they drive 15 miles over here, spend an hour and a half with this lady. She buys, she might not buy. Then they drive clear across town here, 35 miles. That person's not here. Then they drive over here 10 miles, make a sale. And then on the way home, they, they see if they can knock a few doors. You saw four people that day. Now, with leads, when you call them, let's say you, you have people that get them on a call, a triage, you transfer them into like a Zoom meeting, you can see 12, 14 people a day. 
you're seeing three times as more prospects every day virtually on Zoom. Point, you learn the right skills. It doesn't matter if you're in the home or on Zoom. And their sales went up over 300% the next two years just because they were talking. They were seeing a lot more prospects. And they'll never go back to the way they were doing it before. Yeah. See, that just changed their whole way of thinking. They just didn't know what they didn't know. Car sales too. You know, we train the largest used car dealership in um, Canada. It's called 401 Auto. Okay. And they came on about two months before COVID. Now, remember, Canada was extremely strict with their lockdowns. Mm. I don't know if it was strict where you're at. Like here in Arizona, it was closed down maybe five weeks and oh, back yeah. to Oregon. Business. Oregon was strict. Yeah. But in Canada, they were like, I mean, they were locked down up until like maybe six months ago, seven months ago. And quite literally, you could not go into a car dealership. It was illegal. You couldn't walk into a retail place like that. Okay. You get arrested. So we taught them. Uh, put their salespeople at home, generate leads. They started learning from, you know, how to get leads. People are still looking for cars, right? right. They're still yeah. driving, okay? And they would start getting people on Zoom meetings and they would make the sale over Zoom. And then they would meet that person at the car dealership outside because they couldn't go inside, do the paperwork. Here's your keys. And they would drive off. Their sales went up over 120% the next year during COVID. Wow. And they couldn't even go into their offices, Wow. And they were thinking about filing bankruptcy because they freaked out. Now, a lot of a lot of car dealerships up there did. And 401 bought a lot of them because they had a bunch of cash coming in. So it's just how it's just how you view things when happens. Like businesses yeah. that that okay, thought outside the box and were open to change thrived. Companies that just couldn't get out of their own way of thinking, this is the only way we can do it, those are the ones that died. Right. Now there are some industries that you know, like I, I, we have a client um, out of the UK that's the largest um, advertising company. So like when you walk into an airport and you see all the big screens in the commercials, where they're the ones that sell that advertising space on uh, every large airport in the world. Okay. And, you know, like when you get on a flight and you read the little magazines with oh, all yeah. the ads, they're the ones that sell that ad space. Okay. Now, if there's zero planes... There's not much you can do. Right. So they had to wait about four or five, six months. Nothing we could do for them, right? They, you're, there's no planes going on and you're in planes. You yeah. can't really change. But for the most part, if you learn how to change and you can adapt and think outside the box, you can thrive when those situations happen. It's only the ones who think that there's only one way to do it that typically die. Yeah, makes sense. Now, what advice would you have for these inspiring entrepreneurs, those folks that are listening at home? You have a lot of sales tips. What advice would you have for them? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of business owners take this position like, oh, I'm not in sales. I don't need to learn how to sell. But I think one thing we don't understand is that like everybody on planet Earth in one way or the other is in sales. Like, let, let's think about it here. Even if you don't get paid a commission, I mean, you're a business owner, you're in sales, right? Yep. Like if you're trying to convince, if you're trying to get your employees that you're hiring right now, to follow the vision of where you want to take your company, what are you doing? You're trying to persuade, you're trying to influence, and you're trying to convince and move others, right? So we call that non-sales selling. You're not making a commission necessarily, but you're still out there every day trying to influence, persuade, move others. I mean, if you're an attorney who's trying to convince a jury of your peers that your client's innocent, what are you doing? You're trying to persuade, you're trying to influence, you're trying to convince them, right? If you're let's say a teacher who's trying to convince their kids to do their homework and get better grades. What are you trying to do? You're trying to persuade, influence, convince, right? Hell, if you're arguing politics online, if you do it the <laughs> right way, you're trying to persuade, influence, and move others. So really everybody on planet earth in one form is in sales because everybody's trying to move, persuade, and convince others every single day of their lives. So especially as a business owner, you probably want to learn those skills because I can assure you business owners who learn those skills far out earn business owners who don't learn those skills. It just is what it is. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Now for listeners at home that are interested in the seventh level and kind of want to get more in depth about it, how do they find your information? Where are you at uh, on social media? Yeah, do this. They can, they can get, a, uh, they can get some nibbles first before yeah. they get into any training, but it just have them join our free Facebook group. That's, there we have go. about 30,000 people in that Facebook group. I think I gave you the link. So have them go to www.salesrevolution.pro. Uh, so salesrevolution.pro. And right when they join, 
uh, have them check their Facebook messenger because somebody in my team will, they'll say, Hey, I'm with seventh level. We'll message them over a free training called the NEPQ 101 mini course. And it's our CEO just breaking down the different stages of NEPQ from connecting to commitment. And he's going to give you some examples of different questions you can use for different sales situations you're in right now. That alone will probably help you sell even more than you're doing now. But we typically go live um, in that Facebook group about three to four times a week, different Q&As, different training. But that'll give them a little hors d'oeuvre yeah, of kind yeah. of what we do. And then if they want to really learn advanced skills so they sell a lot more, um, they can just obviously message us in that Facebook group. They'll have all the contact information there. They can always reach out. Perfect. Jeremy. Awesome. And again, folks, I'll have all this information um, in regards to the NEPQ uh, Facebook information as well on the newsletter. So please feel free to subscribe to the newsletter. Jeremy Miner, the co-founder, former CEO of Seventh hey, Level. Oh, man. Thank you so much. I mean, I'm I'm all amped up. Uh I got to tell you, like you got me, you're dropping just amazing information. I think I really hope the listeners are really taking notes because it, there is really some good insight. And, and I, in fact, after this, I want to chat with you a little bit about, um, you, you mentioned, uh, some public speaking. So I want to chat with you about that. Cause I think I might have a national conference. I kind of think that you'd be perfect. Good for so folks at home, please, uh, please check us out on the shades of E.com. You can also follow me at the shades of E on all of the social channels. And yes, I did get a TikTok, but you will not see me dancing on that. Please subscribe to the newsletter and have a great night thank you for tuning in to the shades of entrepreneurship for more information please follow the shades of e on twitter instagram facebook or visit the shades of e.com